The Endless Ocean by Toby Bennett. Chapter 1 The water cleared, each ripple frozen until the surface looked like smooth glass. Then, just as suddenly, white foam formed upon the motionless crest of each tiny ripple. Sound crashed in, a roaring ocean all around that seemed to stretch out beyond the smooth wooden bowl in her hands. The water moved now in rolling green waves, around her, beneath her. She bit her lip to stop from screaming at the savagery of the water which threatened to engulf her. A single drop of blood fell unheeded from her ruptured lip, becoming a dark stain on the waves. Not a stain, a ship, a ship with crimson sails unfurled and ragged rigging running before the storm. The ship was not one of the smoke-belching iron steamers that lumbered past on their unending journeys to the ports of Europa. It was a sailboat built for speed, three masts straining against the wind. To Claire's eyes, the tiny figures on the deck looked no more than ants, desperate and wild, apart from one who stood bound in the crow's nest outlined by a blue flame that burned at the tip of the mast. She could not tell whether the pale blue radiance emanated from the cowled man or from the electric fire playing about the masthead, but as soon as she spotted the bedraggled figure she knew it was he who had summoned her here. She blinked, darkness only for a moment, a second, but when her vision cleared her perspective had shifted. The cowled man was next to her now. They both jerked with the whiplash motion of the mast. Strange syllables escaped the recesses of the man's sodden hood. Claire was sure that the man was shouting, but even now his words came only as a whisper that she strained to understand. Where, where is it? The man gasped without warning. He turned his face to her and his voice swelled above the storm. Show me the way, Claire, he demanded. Somehow the thought of disobeying was horrifying as horrifying as the pulpy caverns where eyes used to be, and the dreadful familiarity of his face. She must help, do something, but, but what? Where? Show me the way, Claire! How did he know her, and how did his blind eyes see? Abruptly the crow's nest hatch slammed open and a sailor climbed into the wooden basket. Blue radiance reflected in the silver blade of his curved dagger. The sailor snarled something Claire could not hear, then advanced on the cowled man. Claire! The man howled in desperation as he strained against the ropes. Thin rills of blood flowed as the rough fibers tightened still further. A dull pulling reached her through her confusion and panic. There was no way to explain the tugging in her gut except, what had he said? Show me the way. How could she possibly do that, and what good would it do this doomed stranger if she could? The knife man had almost reached his victim. Claire, now! Claire made an instinctive gesture. She reached out towards the source of the inexplicable pressure. Her fingers outlined a doorway in the air, leaving trails of pale light hanging in the storm-wracked sky. The sailor had raised his dagger, but the death blow never came. The knife fell unnoticed to the floor of the crow's nest. The sailor turned to face the golden light that spilt from a portal taller than the mast and wider than the heaving ship. Wonder and terror flickered over his face before the first notes of an unearthly song rang out robbing his face of all emotion. Without a backward glance, the sailor stepped over the side of the crow's nest and plunged down. Claire's scrying bowl exploded before he hit the deck. Claire, what? How dare you ruin these exams? The mistress yelled, her tone harsh enough to jerk those few still in trance back into reality. I found the way already, miss, Violet Cooper said, raising her perfectly drawn map. The charcoal in Claire's own hand was little more than powder. It hardly matters now, Violet, since just about everyone else will have to be given the chance to resit. Just about everyone, Mistress Blakeworthy repeated, giving Claire a hard look. Claire seethed. If it had been Violet, who had been unfortunate enough to have her bowl destroyed. Blakeworthy would be all over her, checking the cuts for splinters. I suggest you make your way to Mistress Latch and then Master Collins in that order, Blakeworthy snarled. Be assured that by the time Mistress Latch has seen your wounds, Master Collins will have been told of your atrocious behaviour. It was an accident, I'm sorry. You will be, young lady. Exams are no place for pranks. Who gave you the fireworks, your brother? That last question at least must have been hard. All the teachers loved Adrian. He was already a year ahead of her, even though they were the same age. 
He'd probably be two years ahead of her after this. Two years of being alone when they'd sent him off to the academy. Could she bear it? A dark part of her wondered if Adrian would be held back too if she implicated him. But the idea was dead before it really formed. The academy was all her brother dreamed of. In any case, Blakeworthy would never really believe her brother was involved. She simply wanted Claire to clear her brother or add perjury to her tally of wrongdoings. An obvious trap. Of course not, Claire answered, removing the one obstacle to Blakeworthy's full wrath. Good, at least you have the maturity to face your transgressions alone. The woman purred, prepared to be generous in victory. Now go and clean yourself up and report to Master Collins. Ma'am, Claire replied stiffly. She stood with as much dignity as she could muster in her drenched and clinging robes. Small chips of wood rattled on the floor as she rose, but she didn't shift her gaze from her teacher's face. Go, you innocent child, Blakeworthy snapped, looking away first. Now, Violet, let me see your map. Well done for being able to finish in such a short time. It was easy, ma'am, but... Claire increased her pace and cut off the rest of Violet's insufferable crowing by leaving the exam room. Claire's shock and outrage evaporated almost as soon as she closed the classroom door. She blinked back tears with effort. Dry-eyed but almost blind with the restrained emotion, Claire staggered towards the infirmary. You look a sight, Adrian's voice bloomed in her mind. Cured of her blurred vision by the unexpected contact, Claire looked about for the source of the comment. Sure enough, a piece of stonework rippled and became the radiant scales of her brother's familiar. Not the cat that was issued to him, his gecko. If they knew about him, Adrian would be in as much trouble as his sister, or worse. All novices were bonded to an animal at the end of their first year. If he'd known it had to be the animal the school provided, Adrian would probably never have bound himself to the mercurial reptile. But fate had overridden his usual reverence for the rules. They had barely started their training when the gecko had glided in through the open window. Claire had oohed and aahed over the creature's scales, mesmerized by the patterns that adorned the skin and stretched over the modified ribs that served it as wings. But it was Adrian who had truly been enthralled. One look into those crystal eyes, and the bond had happened as naturally as breathing. She heard Adrian in her head because there was part of Adrian lodged in the gecko. Though he had done his utmost to be worthy of the academy since that day, Adrian could no more break that first bond than cut off his own hand. Claire had always told him not to try. The first thing they taught a young seer was to mistrust the notion of coincidence. She had never seen a reptile quite like it in her fifteen years. There had been times when she had been jealous of her brother's bond, but she knew the effort it had taken to convince his instructors that the cat was his true familiar. If the masters had realized that his success came without the reserves of a familiar to call on, they would probably have sent him off to the academy already. The thought of being left alone brought fresh tears to her eyes, but she denied them with as much resolve as she had their predecessors. Hello, Echo, she said, reaching out to touch his cold flank. The gecko unfolded one of his rudimentary wings and allowed her to stroke it. Adrian's not with you, then? She asked, though she already knew the answer. Echo would never submit to being stroked if her brother was riding behind his eyes. He's still in the exam room, working with that furry savage. The relationship between the cat and Gecko had been strained, to say the least. Fortunately, in the past year, Echo had grown enough to make him more than a meal for a cat. Indeed, if it were not for his gift of camouflage, at over a foot long, his size would be on the verge of becoming a real problem. What exam are they doing? Why aren't you helping? It's all reading today. Reading. No matter how casual her brother had become about it over the years, it still disturbed her to think that if he wished, he could peel back the layers of her mind. It was even said that the Academy's finest could plant ideas that you would never know from your own. When they were young, she had always felt the feathered touch of his thoughts. Twins were close, though he assured her he could not go where she did not let him. But as his training had intensified, she knew it was only his self-discipline that kept him from trespassing on her privacy. He could still use your strength, Claire murmured. She knew that there was little that a familiar could do for a sensitive when it came to mind reading. However, not having the energy he had invested in his familiar close to hand would put Adrian at a disadvantage. Who knew he might not be the first to finish this time? You know he won't need me, Echo responded, almost entirely disguising his fear that he might somehow be failing his master. Do you really want me to sit in a room full of bored and hungry cats? Despite her mood, Claire couldn't help but smile at the thought of the overgrown lizard facing down a classroom of felines. You wouldn't be afraid, would you, Echo? Claire teased. You wound me, my brother's sister, the gecko answered, raising his golden crest in indignation. It has been a long time since I ran from those fur piles. Maybe one day they will run from me. Echo straightened his body and lifted his head to exhibit a row of needle-sharp teeth. 
Perhaps you'd best stick to insects. Not funny. Anyway, there's more meat on a rat. The gecko's back arched as if he was about to pounce on something, and his feral grin became impossibly wide. Only if you've got a week to lie around digesting, Claire said with a wicked smile. That's the first rat I ever ate. And if you have any sense, it will be the last. Some of her gloom lifted at the memory of the swollen reptile. I'm bigger now. I could eat a rat a day. Fat chance. I wonder what cat tastes like, the gecko speculated wistfully, deliberately ignoring Claire's rudeness. You've got nothing to do for the rest of the month, then. Before he could answer, or she could ask him anything else, Echo's body flattened, his colourful patterns melted into the uniformity of the stone behind him, and his scales rose to perfectly mimic the texture of the wall. Echo? Miss Watts! Mistress Latch's voice echoed down the corridor. Are you just going to stand dripping in my hallway, or do you have some business here? Coming, ma'am. Mistress Blakeworthy sent me. I know that, you silly girl, so why did I have to come looking for you in the hallways? That was a nasty surprise. How did Mistress Latch already know she was coming? Fear renewed itself. Would they really hold her back, or worse, expel her? There were places more terrible for orphans than this. The children here had talent, and would be groomed to enter the academy. There were orphanages and workhouses which offered no higher future than slaving in grey factories or serving as a maid in some great house. Adrian cannot be here, but I'll watch over you for him, a patch of brickwork assured her. And in the absence of any other comfort, she clung to that as hard as she held on to her tears. There's nothing wrong with you, which from what I hear is less than you deserve, Mistress Latch roughly flattened the last foul-smelling plaster to Claire's brow. Claire kept her eyes down and mouth shut. She stared daggers at Millicent Prith's shoes. Unable to resist the chance to show off her no-doubt perfect work, Violet had sent Millicent to stir the poison in her stead. Millicent had been sitting to Claire's left when the bowl exploded, and she had a thin gash on her cheek to show for it. Claire didn't doubt that Violet had refused all Blakeworthy's attention until her friend's mortal wound was dealt with. So Millicent had been sent scurrying to Mistress Latch with the tale of Claire's disgrace. Claire knew Millicent was not innocent of malice either, since she had managed to arrive first and made it seem Claire was dawdling. It's no good. I can't eat her for you. Echo mentally whispered. I'd choke on those ponytails. I really don't know what happened, Mistress Latch, Claire said, trying to ignore the voice in her head. I was just trying to complete my exam like everyone else. You expect me to believe that the bowl just exploded on its own, Claire? I hope you have a better explanation when you speak to Master Collins. I couldn't think of eating him. He's all bone, said the gecko apologetically. Claire caught herself before she laughed at the thought of the gangly master disappearing into the tiny maw of the overeager carnivore. It's the truth, ma'am. Claire didn't know why she bothered. She knew how these things worked. The story would be all over the school in hours. Two teachers now believed that she had played a stupid prank with fireworks rather than face her exams. She would not be asked to give her version of events, and anything she said in mitigation would simply seem like lies or excuses. The worst part was that the evidence was against her. She had every motive to fear these exams. Claire was as good as any of the others when scrying with flame or glass. One of the reasons Violet bothered to be so cruel to her was that Claire had even on occasion outperformed her. However, when it came to the most important of the navigator's tools, the scrying bowl, she lacked the ability to focus. While the others seemed to be able to narrow their vision to whatever piece of coast or dangerous waters were required, Claire saw anything but the routes the instructors asked them to find. Now things seemed to be going from bad to worse. For all her previous failures, the exam had been the first time she'd experienced such a violent reaction to one of her visions. She was still trying to process all the implications and come to grips with what she had seen on the strange ship, which left her little or no capacity to defend against allegations of fireworks she knew had never existed in the first place. Are you going to stand about all day? Mistress Latch demanded. I've done all that needed to be done, so you can stop catching flies. Her lip quirked. Master Collins is waiting. It was hopeless. No one was going to believe what had actually happened. In the past, her teachers had simply told her that she had invented her bizarre visions. They had to believe that she'd had fireworks or they'd have to admit what she knew. That she'd achieved a real seeing with real power behind it. What else could have caused the explosion? Not that she could really blame anyone for their doubt. Only the rarest adepts had the strength to manipulate more than a few pounds of their mind. The idea that a seer's trance could have such a physical effect was, by all accepted science, impossible. 
Well, off you go, Mistress Latch said, breaking into her thoughts a second time. And be quicker about it than you were getting here, my girl. You don't want him to wait for you under these circumstances. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. I could take a tow while she's asleep, Echo blustered as they hurried down the corridor. You'll do no such thing, Claire admonished him. Not that the gecko was likely to follow through on his threat, but he'd been acting up recently. No doubt Adrian's growing expectation of being a senior next year was giving the capricious carnivore delusions of grandeur. Not wanting to be caught dawdling again, Claire paid no attention to Echo's continued threats against Millicent Prith and hurried down the school's wide, dark corridors. Her pace only slowed when she began to climb the stairs to the master's tower. By the time she reached the third floor, she had slowed further, caught between a need to know the worst and to delay the inevitable. Outside the master's ornate doors, she caught sight of herself in one of the long mirrors. Her robes were mostly dry now, but they still clung to a thin boyish frame. Her red hair was cut short. Apart from the single plait that marked her as an apprentice, there was little to distinguish her from her brother. In recent months, she had begun looking for differences. Not that she was preoccupied with her looks like Violet, but she hoped she wasn't going to resemble Adrian so closely forever. Perhaps if she weren't quite so thin. Stepping forward, she idly worried at the plaster on her forehead before trying to neaten her robes. You're not going to get any prettier in the next few minutes, Miss Watts, the master boomed from behind the door. Claire jumped at the sound and smoothed her robes with hurried motions. Sorry, sir, coming, sir, she replied nervously. Echo, of course, was nowhere to be seen in the face of this new threat. Just as well if the master could see through walls. In her hurry, Claire yanked the door open, only to freeze again at the thought that this might be taken for rudeness. Well, shut the door, Master Collins snapped. We'll never get to the bottom of this if you insist on hovering in my doorway. Yes, sir. Sorry, sir. She closed the door with a sound like the last click of a sprung trap. Good. Now, Claire, I have received a note from Mistress Blakeworthy saying you disrupted the navigation exams. Yes, sir, but, but it was an accident. You're saying these fireworks just went off then? Sir, I swear there were no fireworks. So, the scrying ball just exploded for no reason, is that it? He scoffed. No, not for no reason, sir. Claire remembered to add the sir just in time to soften the master's growing scowl. Why then? the master asked, leaning forward. He didn't have Adrian's strength, but Claire could feel his mind probing hers. Instead of trying to resist, she opened her memory to his probing. It was the vision, she said, replaying the chaotic scene in her mind's eye. When the song began, it just blew apart. Oh, well done, Claire. You've projected that so well, I could almost believe it. I shall have to admonish Adrian for practicing his readings with you. He knows mentalism is not a feminine discipline. It doesn't matter whether you decide to come clean or not, though. I would have thought that given the opportunity to mitigate what you have done, you would have taken it. Sir? No more nonsense. You might as well claim a man could fly as that the bowl might explode just because of your vision. By all rights, I could have you sent to Hillgrange for this. At least you would no longer be our problem. Still mindful of the master's injunction against talking, Claire bit her already swollen lip at the mention of a school with such a bad reputation. It was what she feared most. If she were sent away, she would truly be on her own. The master watched her through hooded eyes, daring her to make any kind of sound in protest. When it became clear that she would not rise to the bait, he continued. There are only two reasons why I won't be sending you away. Would you like to know what they are? Yes, sir. Firstly, your brother is the most talented sensitive this school has ever produced, with every chance of being appointed to the Duke's personal staff once he graduates. A very distant second is the fact I do not wish to see your talents wasted. Thank you, sir. Claire kept her eyes down and her hands neatly clasped. Of course, the fact that I have decided to keep you on means that we are going to have to do something about your behaviour. It was an accident, sir. It won't happen again. <laughs> really? If it was an accident, as you say, how can you be so sure it won't happen again? Master Collins tone rose in a mocking parody. I, I won't let it, sir. I'll practice every day. An excellent idea, Claire. But how will you practice with your scrying bowl in pieces? I'll begin another carving, sir. I can finish it in a week. No, I think it might take you two at the least. Until then, you have my permission to use the water in the girls' bathrooms. Please be sure to keep the toilets clean, since the cleaning staff will be told to steer clear lest they interrupt your meditations. Master Collins was used to laughing at his own jokes, and so wasn't put out by Claire's lack of good humour at his announcement. 
Between cleaning the toilets and carving a new bowl, you should be too busy to get into any more trouble. When your new bowl is ready, you will be re-examined. Fortunately, the others will be on holiday, so you'll spoil no one's chances with any more funny business. If you fail this exam or anything untowards happens, you'll be held back a year. Collins paused, allowing what he said to sink in. Once more, Claire felt a light probing. This time she battered the intrusion aside, closing her mind as her brother had taught her. Master Collins frowned at this, but decided not to pursue the matter. You think my decision fair? Even with two weeks of cleaning toilets ahead, Claire couldn't help but admit she would got off lightly. Yes, very fair, thank you, sir. Then get out of my sight, young lady, and don't let me see you here under these sorts of circumstances again. Without any further urging, Claire stood up and quickly scurried towards the study door. Oh, and Miss Watts, one more thing. Yes, Master Collins, she replied, doubt clouding her sense of relief. Make sure that you do not cause your brother any undue distress over this. He needn't know that we discussed expulsion. We want him on his best form for next year. There's the Duke's grant and scholarship to think of. As if you know what his best is, Claire thought smugly from behind the wall her brother had taught her to throw up around her mind. Master Cullen's eyes narrowed. As you say, sir, she blurted and backed towards the door. Very good. Master Collins returned his attention to the papers on his desk. You may report to Mistress Blakeworthy and tell her what I have decided. Yes, Master Collins. Claire pulled the door shut quickly before the master could think of any other humiliation for her. That night, Claire would dream of the ocean, her hand aching from carving a new bowl and dry from the caustic soap in the girls' lavatories. She would dream of being far away, in a storm on a sea she did not know. She was no stranger to the ocean, for all oceans are one ocean. Though she cannot know it, a ship with crimson sails and a ruined mast, separated from her by time and tide, now floats becalmed on a glassy sea.